Hello there, this is Professor Nathanson. Um, this is yet another in our series of videos on discovery. This is video number seven and the topic is going to be interrogatories. What is an interrogatory? To whom may an interrogatory be directed? See Rule 33a. All right, interrogatories are questions that are in writing with answers that are in writing. They're to be distinguished with depositions, with a depo, the answer is always oral. Now with depots you can have written questions, that's rule 31. You're going to have oral questions, that's rule 30. Okay, But for depositions, whether under rules 30 or 31, the answers are always oral. So let's be clear, with an interrogatory, the questions and the answers are both written. Okay. Now, something you may recall from our video on uh, depositions is deposition can be taken of a party and may also be taken of a non-party witness. What about interrogatories? Can interrogatories be posed of a non-party witness? Unless otherwise stipulated or ordered by the court, a party may serve on any other party. All right. The answer is no. Depositions can be on witnesses who are not parties. Interrogatories can only be served on other parties. All right. Well, what is the purpose of an inter interrogatory? Purpose of an inter interrogatory in one sense is the same as any other discovery device, which is to find information that is relevant to any claim or defense, so long as it's not privileged and is proportional, proportionate to the needs of the case and so on. For information on relevance in 26B, look at the video. I believe that's video number two. But in another sense, um, interrogatories have somewhat limited utility. Um, you could have an interrogatory that's very open-ended and broad and ask the defendant to answer that. But keep in mind that the interrogatories are questions and answers. And typically the questions are written by lawyers. The answers are written by lawyers. So, you know, the questions are usually going to be pretty broad and lawyers are going to try to find every way they can within the rules to either not answer, to answer very narrowly. Okay. So as a discovery device, as a fact-finding device, interrogatories sometimes are of limited utility. I'm not saying don't use them and they absolutely should use them. But keep in mind that, that probably the best place for more open-ended questions is going to be a deposition. And if you want to look for information from a variety of sources, consider document requests. Perhaps one of the main uses for interrogatories are to ask targeted questions about witnesses um, who may have discoverable information. Um, to ask about uh, doc existence of documents or locations of documents. Um, that's probably a pretty good use of interrogatories. And, and now you're going to think for a minute. But Professor Nathanson, I thought information on witnesses and on, on document, documents and their location is already covered under Rule 26A1 Initial Disclosures. And that's true. 26A1 Initial Disclosures does require parties to pony up names of witnesses and other documents or you know a description of those documents. Um, without being asked. There are required disclosures. See the video on disclosures. However, keep in mind the 26A1 initial mandatory disclosures is only for information in support of the disclosing party's case. So 26A1 will, will require plaintiff to give up certain information that helps plaintiff. will require defendant to pony up information that helps defendant but it's not going to require them to give information that hurts them or that helps their opponent. All right, so don't rely just on 26A disclosures. You got to use other discovery devices and interrogatories can oftentimes be a good way of getting more information regarding documents, regarding witnesses and things. Um, who are they where they can be found? etc cetera, etc cetera, um, and so on well next question may a party serve 10 uh, interrogatories 
or excuse me, what is the default maximum number of interrogatories? See 33A, all right. The answer is 25, 25 written interrogatories. So could you do this? Could you ask 25 questions? In fact, could you ask just one question that's in 57 subparts, right? And the answer is no. That's of course, may a party serve 10 interrogatories each with three subparts? The answer is no, because 10 times three is 30. And the rule says no more than 25 interrogatories, including all discrete subparts, okay? So you can't have more than 25. If you have, you know, say five questions, um, each of which has five subparts, you know, then you're at your 25. So like, you know, it's one and then you get A, B, C, D, E, two, A, B, C, D, E, and so on. All right. Well, if you have five of them like that, then you're at 25. And then invariably the question comes up from students every year. Well, well, professor, what counts as a subpart, right? Well, you know, there, there's no clear answer to that. You know, how similar or different are the questions from each other, right? Um, how distinct are they? Um, it, as a practical matter, you know, the, the rule says 25 written sub, 25 interrogatories um, counting the subparts. You think, well, well, what if somebody objects to one of them? Well, let, let them object, right? You know, you should proceed in good faith, but your opponent's not always going to agree with you. Act in good faith, and, you know, if you have to negotiate it out, negotiate it out. Um, certainly, the parties can stipulate to additional interrogatories, or the court can order in additional interrogatories. Let's be honest. You know, say the questions you think you're going to need to ask is going to be, say, like 35 rather than 25. Well, maybe your opponent wants more than 25 interrogatories of you as well. Then negotiate it. Um, be civil. Work with your opponent to resolve things so that you don't have to go bug the court, because we all know how much courts love, love, love to be uh, bothered with discovery disputes. All right. Um, briefly, I'll, I'll mention the uh, movie Back to School. Um, these days, I'm not sure if everybody's seen it, but it's a classic film with the late, great Rodney Dangerfield. And in the film, Dangerfield is a, a wealthy businessman who never graduated from college. His son goes to college. So uh, Rodney Dangerfield decides to go back to school and get his college degree so he can spend more time with his son. Well, Rodney gets into all sorts of trouble at school. He's accused of plagiarizing um, a paper or of having somebody else write the paper for him. Um, they're on the verge of kicking him out. And then to make sure that he's actually done the work, they decide to do an oral examination of him at the end of the semester. And all of the professors, all of the professors are um, lined up here. I don't know if you can see the, the markings. The professors are lined up, right? And there's Rodney Dangerfield, and each of the professors, you know, gives him his oral final examination. You know, kind of like with the PhD, where you have your, your oral exam when you're going for a PhD. And the English teacher hates Rodney Dangerfield. Why? The English teacher hates him because Rodney Dangerfield has stolen from the, uh, from the, oh, did I say English teacher? I think it's the History teacher, my bad, history teacher. The, the the mean history teacher hates Rodney Dangerfield because Rodney Dangerfield has stolen from the mean history teacher, um, the beautiful English teacher um, played by uh, Sally Kellerman. You may also know from the movie MASH. So Sally steals a woman from the history teacher. The history teacher hates him. And now the history teacher asks him a question. Here's the exam. English teacher, the history teacher says, I have only one question for Mr. Mellon, he says. And Mr. Mellon looks all relaxed. And then he says, in 27 parts. <laughs> then Ronnie Dangerfield mumbles, I'd like to break him into 27 parts, all right? It's a great movie. I don't know if it's on um, Netflix, but uh, it's great. I really recommend that you watch it. In fact, I think I'm going to have to watch it tonight. Well, obviously, 27 parts. Where am I going with this? Obviously, 27 parts would be too many under Rule 25, or Rule 33. You can't have one question in 27 parts. That would violate Rule 33A. All right, moving on. Um, I don't see the question here, but I'll, I'll ask it. How, how many um, 
interrogatories. Oh, we it is there. It's question number two. My bad. I skipped over number two and went right to number three. Let's go back to question two. What's the default maximum number of interrogatories? See 33A. Well, you've watched the deposition video, I would assume, and you'll remember that the default number of depositions is 10 uh, measured by groups. So, so 10 total for the plaintiffs as a group, 10 total for the defendants as a group, and 10 total for the third party defendants as a group. What about interrogatories? Well, it says, a party may serve on any other party, no more than 25 written interrogatories, right? So we're looking under 33A and wondering, what if you have P1 and P2 versus D1 and D2, right? So you have four claims, P versus D1, P1 versus D2, P2 versus D1 and D2, right? Well, under depositions, rule 30, the plaintiffs would be limited to 10 depositions and the defendants would be limited to 10 depositions as a group. Would that also be the case for the interrogatories? Are the plaintiffs limited to 25 total and the defendants limited to 25? Um, tell me, what's the answer? Well, here it says a party. What parties are there? Well, there's P1, P2, D1, and D2, right? A party may serve on any other party. And who are they? Again, P1, P2, D1, and D2. And no more than 25 written inter interrogatories. Compare the language of this to the language of Rule 30. Rule 30 expressly uh, groups the number of depositions by um, types of parties, right? But Rule 33A1 doesn't group them by types of party. It's quite specific that it goes A party, in other words, any single party, say like P1 or P2 or D1 or D2, may serve on any other party, same thing, up to those 25 uh, interrogatories. So the answer here is it's not 25 as a group, rather P1 could seek 25 interrogatories of D1, 25 interrogatories of D2, um, I suppose even 25 interrogatories of P2, though uh, I'm not sure why that would be necessary, perhaps if there's a cross claim, which is always possible, right? All right, and the same thing, D1 and D2 can each take uh, 25 interrogatories of P1, P2, right? D1 could do interrogatories of D2 and so on and so forth. So it's not measured by groups of the type of parties, but rather it's 25 for each um, individual uh, party against um, any other uh, party. So and again, so just to simplify it, P1, now let's do it this way, P versus D1 and D2, let's simplify it. Well, P can make 25 interrogatories of D1 and can make 25 interrogatories of D2 because that's one party against any one other party. So it's not 25 plus 25 is 50, it's 25 for that one party against that, that other party and then 25 here for this one party against this other uh, party. All right. Okay, question number four is uh, important. Um, who signs the answers to interrogatories? Who signs it under oath? Who signs any objections? Is it done, done under oath? Look at rule 33B, all right? The answers to the interrogatories are done by the party to whom they're asserted. However, any um, objections that are made are gonna be signed by the attorney that makes them. Now, of course, if there's no attorney and the, the party is acting pro se, you know, without a lawyer, then obviously any objections to the interrogatory is going to be signed by the party. But in, in your typical case litigated in federal court, the party is going to be represented, hopefully, and it's going to be the attorney that signs the objections. So it makes sense that the party is signing the, um, is signing the answers. The party actually makes the answers, and the party who makes the answers here, let's clean this up. The party who makes the answers also has to sign them, okay? So this is a Q&A. The answers to the questions are made by the party, not by the lawyer, and they're signed by the person who is making the answers. Again, the party. The only thing the attorney signs is any objections. Now, I'll talk about in a minute why this is the way it is, all right, but let's just get the technicals over and then we'll understand why it works this way. 
What about oath? Each interrogatory must, to the extent that it's not objected to, put that in brackets, uh, be answered separately and fully in writing under oath. Okay, well, who answers interrogatories? That's going to be the party. So, put differently, if you have P makes an interrogatory of D, all right, then D answers in writing and signs under oath. What does the lawyer sign? Lawyer signs objections, but not under oath. Okay. Now first, why is the oath required not of the lawyer? Why is the oath required rather of, of the answerer? Well, just like with a deposition, a deposition, the person who's being deposed is answering, you have to answer under oath because that encourages truth-telling and informs the, the deponent of the importance of telling the truth and the seriousness and formality of what's going on. And the same is true of a um, interrogatory, okay? The person who is the party that's receiving these questions, they have to answer and they have to sign. They have to sign under oath to remind them of the importance of reading their own answers carefully, making sure they're right, and then making sure they're telling the truth, okay? The lawyer signs too, but only the objections, and there's no need to sign that under oath because they're, they're not answering the questions, they're objecting to questions. So there's no requirement of, of oath-taking. Now, a couple questions is, well, why doesn't the lawyer sign under oath? Well, think about it. Who knows the facts? Does the lawyer know the facts or does the party know the facts? And of course, it's the party that's supposed to know the facts and it's the party that's answering the uh, interrogatory. So it's the party who's certifying the truth by signing under oath, right? You know, the lawyer doesn't know the facts. It's the personal, it's the, the party that's got, oh, it's the party that's got that knowledge that's going to um, um, know whether the answers are true or not. So we have the party sign um, under oath. Now, you should be making a big, um, you should have a big question in your mind right now, which is like, okay, 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 wait a minute, professor. I know that technically, the party, technically, the answers are by the party. But let's be honest, Professor Nathanson, the answers are really drafted not by the party, they're drafted by the lawyer, right? Aren't they? And, and that, of course, is, is quite true. The answers are not drafted by the party, they're drafted by the lawyer, okay? But so what? Okay, the lawyer's job is not to make up a bunch of lies for the client to then blindly sign off on, all right? The lawyer and the client have to work together to answer the questions, okay? The client may have to do some factual uh, finding based on what they, they, not just they know, but information that's within their uh, custody, possession, or control. And then they have to, to answer. And typically what's going to happen is the lawyer will have communications back and forth with the client, right? So there's going to be some attorney-client privileged communications. Um, there might be some work, work product prepared by the lawyer, some drafts. And the lawyer is going to take what the client says and, and, and writes back and draft that into an um, interrogatory answer form. The lawyer might think, well, like we're giving up too much information, right? Or we're, we're answering things that aren't required to be answered. Let's cut some of this stuff back. Um, the lawyer may help with the phrasing, but ultimately the truth value of the answers are being certified not by the lawyer, but by the client. You as a lawyer have to realize you can't just draft a bunch of crappy lies for your client to sign off on. You have to draft what your client knows to be true. And you're, you have to counsel your client that, hey, you're signing under oath, so you can't just like, you know, go to the dotted line and sign without reading it. You got to read this and make sure everything is correct. And if there's a problem, client, you, you need to let me know so we can fix it. Because, you know, we don't want to lie because, first of all, it's wrong. Second of all, it can get you in lots of trouble, such as perjury or make you look bad in the litigation um, and so on and so forth. So do the right thing. Doing the right thing doesn't take a lot of effort and uh, makes you a good person and also avoids a lot of crap coming your way later. All right. So even though the answer is drafted by the lawyer, it's a client that signs it. It's the client that signs under oath. And all that you technically sign is any objections you make, which are not under oath. Moving on. 
Uh, let's see. May an interrogatory request the opposing party to state their legal interpretation regarding the facts uh, of the case? Uh, yes, that's 33A. These are what are called uh, contention interrogatories. Uh, that is covered under our rule 33B2, um, the second part. Let's see. An interrogatory may relate to any matter that's inquired to under Rule 26B. So that's the scope of discovery. That's basically, that does, that makes a lot of sense. Second sentence is what matters here. An interrogatory is not objectionable merely because it asks for an opinion or contention that relates to fact or the application of a law to fact. Okay? So in, 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 in contention, interrogatory might be asking for opinion about the facts or about legal analysis, right? The application of law to um, various facts. Um, believe it or not, that is an appropriate interrogatory. And an interrogatory is not objectionable merely because it asks for um, your opinion regarding fact or the party's uh, opinion regarding the application of a law to fact. And you think about that, that's a little bit odd because it's kind of asking your opponent uh, to do their work for you or even to reveal maybe some, some uh, tip their hand on their, their trial strategy, strategy or their opinion of the case. Um, but the rules do permit that, okay? Um, so it's not objectionable on that basis. Um, the court can uh, delay the answering of a um, contention interrogatory under this last clause. The court may order the interrogatory not be answered until there's designated discovery that's complete or a pretrial conference or some other time. Uh, but the main point I want you to understand is what a contention interrogatory, opinion about fact or the application of law to fact. It would appear that would it, be, it would be an improper contention interrogatory just to simply ask somebody to like tell you the law. You know, just ask them to do your legal research for you, like you're lazy and you don't want to waste the time determining the law of contributory negligence in, in say, Alabama. So you say, you know, give your opinion regarding what the law of contributory negligence is in the law in the state of Alabama. Um, without having researched it, um, my belief and my best recollection of the law is that would not be an, that would not be a proper contention interrogatory because it's not asking about your opinion regarding fact. No, it's not asking about your your opinion regarding the application of law to fact, that would just be asking your opinion of what the law is, all right? The application of law to the fact in terms of IRAC would be, you know, these two together, right? Tying law, rule, and analysis together, even almost like IRAC, you know. On this issue, what's your opinion regarding contributory negligence considering the following facts, right? That sounds much more like a proper a contention um, interrogatory. All right, what else does that leave? Question number six. So this is one of the shorter videos. Yay, we're almost done with the videos. Question number six um, asks, instead of answering an interrogatory, may a party merely refer the requesting party to the answering party's business records? Under what circumstances? So that, that's a pretty good rule. Um, here it is down here, uh, 33D. Okay, suppose your client receives an interrogatory that is really broad and open-ended and, and you know, your client doesn't know the answer off the top of her head, but, you know, they can find out the answer with uh, business records that are within their possession, custody, and control, and your client's throwing up her hands and saying, like, you know, my goodness, you know, I can answer this interrogatory, but I'm going to have to spend 50 hours going through huge stacks of documents, and, you know, I, I don't want to do it. And so you tell your client, well, it, you don't have to do it because what we can do is, you know, just give them the business records, right? So if an in answer to an interrogatory question may be determined by examining, auditing, compiling, abstracting, blah, 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 parties' business records, including electronic information. So if the answer can be obtained by looking at the answering party's business records, and if the burden on the answering party, you know, is substantially the same for either party, then the party that's answering the interrogatory can, can instead of answering, they can answer by specify the records, right, sufficient detail to enable the questioning party, the interrogating party, to locate and identify them, and giving that party a reasonable opportunity to examine and audit those records and to make copies, blah, blah, blah. So your client could answer the interrogatory by saying, do it yourself, you know, and here's the records you're going to need, need to look at and, you know, come on by and you can look at these records and make copies and summaries and all of them have fun. 
All right. So that's a, a completely legitimate way to answer uh, a burdensome interrogatory. In fact, if the burden on the answering party is more or less the same, right, for either party. Okay. Now, here's a question. Do you want your client to do this? Do you want your client to take the Rule 33D route? Take a few seconds. What's your answer? Is your answer yes? Let's do it. Let's save that time. B, no way. What's the answer? Um, I don't have an answer. Um, I'll tell you my opinion in, in many cases. I, I think I would tilt towards B. Uh, no. Let's think about it. Let's say you go the 33D route and you say your, your client answers the interrogatory by saying, ah, you know, opponent, just do your own work and come on by and I'll let you start looking at all my papers and records. Uh, what? Really? You're going to invite somebody to just start looking through your papers? No, maybe you don't want to do that. All right. This is essentially like doing a, a document production. You're allowing them to examine and duplicate um, all the relevant records. Well, Dude, before you allow them, the opponent, to look at all those documents, you are going to need to review all those documents. You can't just give your opponent the right to start going through your business records. I mean, I may suppose you could be stupid and let them do it, but that would be incredibly irresponsible. Um, if you don't review the documents first and you give the, uh, the interrogating opponent the opportunity to just look through and copy all your stuff, there could be trade secrets in there. There'd be confidential information in there. There could be work product. Okay. There could be, um, well, there could be attorney client uh, communications, right? There could be all kinds of stuff in there, including stuff that's relevant, excuse me, the stuff that's irrelevant to the lawsuit and that you don't want the uh, opponent to know, right? So, you know, why in the world would you want to give your opponent the right to just like look through your stuff? You know, look at it this way. You know, if somebody wants to know information that you know you have in your wallet, are you going to get the information and, and, and give it up, assuming that you have to? Or are you going to tell them to just start looking through your wallet or your purse or your phone or your laptop? Of course not. You're not going to let somebody just like start looking through your stuff. You, you would want to, you know, review it yourself before you let others look, you know, because of your privacy and because of things like trade secrets, confidential, work product, attorney client, stuff that's irrelevant, non-responsive, but and is the, the other side, none of the other side's business. So really, realistically, if you want to take the 33D option and you're a responsible lawyer, you yourself is going to have to do an extensive document review, review for privilege, work product, and whatever, and call that stuff anyway. And that sounds pretty burdensome, right? So you're really not avoiding burden. And in fact, what you're doing is you you would, by taking the 33D option, I, in my opinion, you're oftentimes going to be taking on a lot of additional burden and uh, also, you know, maybe taking on additional risk. So I'm skeptical about 33 day you know uh parties that, that that deal with interrogatories more than i do may may disagree but my initial reaction is like why in the world would you typically want to do that uh, so i think that's it for um this video i hope this was another helpful video for you and uh see you on the next video this is professor nathanson over and out